Okay, good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to this morning's employment law update. Um, it's a CPD session brought to you by the K3 Hub. Um, for those of you who haven't virtually met me before, my name is Marie, um, and I'm a managing director here at Quantuma. And on behalf of our parent company, the K3 Capital Group, I'm also responsible for the K3 Hub, which is a member network for professional advisors, which has been developed by us here at Quantuma, as well as other companies within the K3 Capital Group. Now, at this stage, I'd normally tell you a little bit about the K3 Hub and the benefits of being part of our growing network. However, I think given the exceptional circumstances of yesterday evening, I think what we'll do is um, instead we'll send you all a brief note next week, um, just explaining some of the, the benefits of being a member. And we, we're also attach a, a copy of the, um, the webinar and CPD programme for the remainder of this year. We've got uh, lots of exciting things planned for you. Um, it goes without saying it's been a, a fairly extraordinary week um, and in the light of in light of the um, the sad news of the passing of the Queen yesterday it, it's fair to say that the the K3 Hub team we did we did agonize over whether we would run this event or not today however we recognize that for those of you who have joined us today that you've committed three hours of um what is inevitably a very busy diary and um, for those that did want to join we, we didn't want to let you down so we did feel it was the right thing to do to go ahead um so without further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome um, welcome you all today and to welcome especially our speaker today, Tony Trevitt. Tony is a qualified HR practitioner, she's a mediator, trainer and coach. She has an in-depth understanding of grievances, disciplinary hearings and appeals. She hears cases for the Employment Tribunal Judiciary and she's worked for both large and small companies in HR and employee relation roles. Today's session will cover the past 12 months and what's new in employment legislation, recent case law, um, current employee rights, and, and a range of hot topics in HR and people management, including um, at, attracting and retaining talent, which I know is a, a real hot topic, especially here at Quantuma, and also flexible working. Um, a few pieces of housekeeping as usual. So we, we do have a poll running this morning. Um, I believe we've got four questions and they will be, um, They'll come up on your screen at relevant points throughout the morning. Um, Q&A function is open, so do feel free to ask Tony questions. I know that we've got a few breaks planned this morning. I think we're going to plan to break on the hour um, at 10 and then again at 11, I believe. But Tony will confirm that. I think what Tony's confirmed is that she'll pick up your questions Um during the breaks and she'll respond accordingly on the return. And finally, we are recording today's session and the recording will be made available on the K3 Hub website um, next week. So without further ado, um, thank you to you all for joining and over to you, Tony. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you for that introduction and, and your words as well. I'm really grateful for that. Um, and welcome everybody to your employment law update and um, overview. So as um, Marie said, my name's Tony Trevette and I work for an organisation called Complete HR Limited. And this session really follows on from our employment law update that we did back in March um, of this year. So I'm really pleased to have been asked back again. And this time we've made a few additions to what we plan to cover as well. Um, so as for the agenda for the next three hours, firstly, we'll look at what's new and what's coming. I'm not going to repeat content from our March session, so have no fears if you were here. Um, then we'll also have a bit of an overview on current employee rights. Um, and then, um, as Marie said, we'll look at hot topics and trends in HR and the world of people management um, at the end. And um, please um, sing out with any questions in the chat box or the Q&A and I'll try and look at those during the, the couple of breaks that we'll have and Marie's quite right I think it makes sense to, to have those breaks kind of on the hour so that's what we plan to do today and um, so let's start then with what's new um, and I can't really avoid uh, mentioning COVID even though to be honest I can't wait until I can I'm just not sure that day is ever going to come um, however I can still remember when the you know we were so relieved that the b word of Brexit was about to, to disappear but then it shortly got replaced by the c word of COVID and I was actually asked the other day what do I think the d word is going to be um, and to be honest it's likely to be downturn which isn't very cheery as economics are looking a bit um, doomy and gloomy however sticking with COVID for a minute, let's have a quick update. Um, before we do that, a question for you. So we're going to have our first poll question, which is, can I go to work if I have 
COVID. And it's a simple yes or no answer. So hopefully you won't need too long to answer that one. So just pick yes or no, basically. I'll give you a minute to do that. So there we go, our answers. 62% of you are a yes, I can go to work if I have COVID and 38% are a no. So the answer actually is yes, you can go to work if you have COVID. Legally, there is nothing stopping you like there was once. Um, it's now just like any other disease. Um, so to be honest, um, unless there are particular implications or requirements from your employer, um, then you're going to be able to go to, to work if you, if you want to. It's just like any other disease now, really. Of course, there will be employers that will say you can't come to work. Um, for example, you know, think about the healthcare um, issues that some organisations will have. Um, and of course, you know, that that means that if, you, if you're required to not attend work because you have COVID, then you will still be able to receive your pay because that's not you being unwilling to work. That's your employer saying that you cannot work. Um, so there's clearly a difference between those two things. But obviously, there's no legislation now on this. Um, nothing in the government and NHS guidelines that say you have to stay at home. Although, to be perfectly honest, it is still a recommendation. So um, let's look at what the pay implications are in a little bit more detail first. If you are able to work from home and well enough to work from home, then you're entitled to your normal pay. So that one's pretty straightforward and simple. If someone cannot work from home um, but feel well enough to work, then can the employer make the workplace uh, safe and suitable for you to still attend and work safely with other people. So we're thinking about masks, you know, isolated office space, maybe staggered work times, those kind of things. Um, but remember, an employee who is not able to work from home and doesn't feel unwell would otherwise be attending at work. So they will be entitled to their normal contractual pay if there are workplace rules that say they cannot come to work. And that's because, as I said, they're basically not attending at their employer's request. Um, so in some cases, this pay may be, may be referred to as sick pay, but it shouldn't be offset against occupational sick pay entitlement. It should be normal full pay and, and it won't be treated as sickness absence under um, any sickness absence policy either. Now, some organisations are saying that they will pay SSP only if someone is unwell with COVID and wasn't vaccinated. And this has been in the press a bit. I'm sure you've read some articles about this. Most contractual sick pay is subject to some sort of discretion. So it may be OK to do that, but not if, a, if an employee may be subject to a claim of breach of contract or constructive dismissal if they are actually withholding sick pay. Obviously, reasonable expectations will need to be made for people who cannot have the vaccine for medical reasons or for religious reasons, for example. So I think when it comes to pay, it's better to be pretty clear um, have this set out contractually so there are no questions and have it well communicated as well, I think. I think it's sensible to approach it in a kind of logical, clear way. Um, it's emotive, this one. OK, let's move on to our next um, what's new uh, point. And this is that the government has confirmed that they will introduce new regulations to allow employers to use agency workers to plug staffing gaps during strikes. Currently, it's unlawful for agencies to supply workers um, uh, to cover um, strike action. And that's been the law for a, you know, a very long time. Um, but significantly, there will also be an increase to the maximum damages that can be awarded against a trade union that takes unlawful industrial action. And that's for unions with 100,000 or more members. So the cap is currently, the cap on damages is currently 20, 
250,000, sorry, and it will rise to 1 million. So that's quite a substantial increase. Um, and the legislation has been laid before Parliament and it will come into force normally, that's about a month um, after it's laid. Um, and the liability of trade unions in proceedings in tort, uh, which is part of this change, uh, will probably come into force um, very shortly. In fact, I think maybe even in July um, that uh, became legislation. So those regulations apply to England, Scotland and Wales. And I read an article recently um, about Harrods, actually, who have a ballot for a strike. 150 staff have balloted to go on strike at Harrods. And Harrods immediately responded threatening this new legislation to um, you know, deal with the strike action that's pending. And they wrote a letter, and I'll read it to you, and it said, recent legislative changes relating to the um, to strike action now allows agencies to provide temporary workers to perform duties normal, normally performed by workers on strike. We are therefore no longer restricted from engaging temporary workers should you take any industrial action either now or in the future. And that was definitely the first employer kind of hot off the press, I think, to say that they'll make use of this legislation. And industrial action is big in the news. You'll no doubt be aware or even affected by some of the train uh, strikes, postal workers, barristers, you know, there's all sorts of things going on. Some have hit the news, some haven't. And in the Conservative leadership race that we've just seen come to a conclusion, there were um, lots of views um, put forward by Ms Truss, and she had a view ahead of, um, of those proposals to make it harder for workers to organise by introducing higher ballot thresholds for, for strike action, taxing strike pay, which would be a new thing, and also implementing minimum service levels in certain sectors that will have a big impact on how effective that strike action might be. I'm not sure she plans to do all of this um, very soon, to be quite honest. I think she's got more pressing issues to deal with. Um, but let's wait and see. It's been dubbed the summer of discontent, so it might well leak into the autumn of discontent soon. Although I read this morning that the rail and postal workers um, strikes due to pay, take place in the next week have been suspended as a, as a mark of respect. So that's uh, one thing to take note of. OK, my next point um, is the, the Home Office is allowing... Um, employers to carry out right to work checks using video calls to job applicants and scanned copies of identity documents um, continuing that this was in response, if you remember, to the COVID-19 pandemic. So they're continuing to allow that to happen uh, by video calls and scanned documents until the 30th of September uh, this year. And the government's also introduced um, a new digital servicing uh, check for British and Irish citizens. Um, that came in on the 6th of April, although manual checks of applicants documents uh, will remain valid um, with those, uh, particularly if there's um, uh, biometric residence permit holders and so on with settled or pre-settled status under the um, EU settlement scheme. Um, so manual checks are no longer acceptable for that. But if you want an up-to-date position, keep checking on the gov.uk website. It sets out what the latest rules are. And from the 1st of October, so when that 30th of September extension comes to an end, um, the checks can be completed in two ways. First of all, it will go back to physical checks. So that's meeting with the employee and ensuring that the documents they're presenting are original, kind of untampered and belong to them. So you check um, take a signed and dated copy of that document and retain it securely. Or you can do this online by appointing what's going to be called identification service providers, IDSPs, um, and watch out for the list of who those, uh, those uh, companies are going to be. So it will go back to a physical check on the 1st of October. Okay, next on our uh, list is um, from the 6th of April, um, I'm sure you will have seen that um, it's no longer a requirement for GPs and other doctors to sign fit notes personally as evidence of an employee's sickness absence. So this is a new set of regulations that allows fit notes to be issued um, digitally. Um, again, a practice that was made commonplace during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And the government's also updated its guidelines 
uh, which um, is called, as you can see, they're getting the most out of the fit notes guidance for employers and line managers. Also, from the 1st of July, um, nurses and occupational um, therapists, pharmacists, physiotherapists and others working in GP practices or hospitals will also be able to issue fit notes. And that change follows from this digitalization um, on the 6th of April. And basically, it's intended to free up you know, GP's time for consultations and kind of streamline the process as well. So um, a few changes in that area for you. Uh, next on our list, I think this is number five, is that the um, government has announced that it will extend the ban on exclusivity clauses currently in place on those who are on a zero hours contract. Um, and what the extension is, is to cover workers on zero hours contracts if they fall below the lower earnings limit. And the threshold for the lower earnings limit at the moment is £123 a week. And um, according to the information I've read, this will now cover, I think it was a further, oh, it was a huge number, like a further 1.5 million workers. Um, and basically exclusivity clauses in these employment contracts are clauses that prevent workers from taking work from other employers. And this ban came into place on um, zero hours uh, workers contracts above the um, lower earnings limit back in, I think it was December. Oh, no, actually, it was in 2015. No, it was much further a, a long ago. So that happened in 2015. This extension was launched as a consultation um, in December 2020. And it will, and I think it went before Parliament this July. So that's a, a definite change that we're going to see if you use zero hours contracts. Um, next on my list, um, and I hope this is a Queen's chess piece, apologies if it's not, but I did some research and I, I thought it was, um, is that the, um, the sixth and final point on what's new is that the Queen's speech this year contained four new bills that are relevant to employment. So we've got the Harbours Seafarers Remuneration Bill. This will give UK ports the power to refuse entry to ships whose crews um, receive less than the national minimum wage. And this bill is in response to ferry operator P&O firing its crew, if you remember this in the news, and replacing them with agency staff on far lower wages. Um, I'm reliably informed that there is no link between P&O cruises and P&O ferries, um, although you would think there would be, but they're owned by entirely different organisations. Um, so uh, this is relevant to and, and arising from that issue with p and um, ferries. The second one is the Modern Slavery Bill. Now, this will this exists already, as I'm sure you're aware, but this bill will make it mandatory for companies with an annual turnover of 36 million or more to publish an annual statement on the government's website outlining the steps they are taking to prevent modern slavery. Um, currently, the reporting is voluntary, so the change is to make this mandatory. And the bill will also introduce um, some fines for companies that don't uh, do that reporting. Um, the next one, as you can see, is the freedom is the Brexit Freedoms Bill. And this will allow the government to change laws that are inherited from the EU without a vote in Parliament. And I understand, although I have to be honest, I haven't counted them, that there are more than 50,000 EU laws that were introduced in the UK over kind of a 25 year period. And they were transferred into the UK statute book after Brexit to allow a functioning legal system, really. Um, and laws include, when it comes to employment, rights to paid holiday, protection from excessive working hours, lots of equality rights, and we had lots of EU-based legislation. So I'm not sure this is a way to start reducing or watering down um, employee rights in the UK. Um, it was said when it was issued that the bill will enable um, you know, us to be able to amend, replace or repeal legislation which better suits the UK without taking, and I quote, decades of parliamentary time to achieve. Um, so I'm sure it's not a negative uh, thing. Um, and then finally, we've got the Data Reform Bill, and this one aims to shift 
kind of data privacy away from being a basic tick box um, exercise towards a more outcomes focused um, framework. And the government maintains that the GDPR and Data Protection Act of 2018 you know, have in some respects encouraged excessive paperwork for businesses. Um, on the 18th of July, this bill was introduced and among other measures, it intends to allow organisations to appoint a senior responsible person to monitor data uh, processing rather than have a DPO, a data protection officer. Um, it will also specify that identifiable personal data um, is data identifiable by those processing or receiving it rather than by anyone at all. It will create lists of recognised legitimate interests when it comes to processing data. And it will also expand the circumstances when a DSA or a data subject access request can be refused. Um, there'll also be restricted automated decision making as part of this bill as well. Um, so a few changes and we'll look out for progress on all four of those um, in due course, really. OK, so let's have a second uh, poll question. So this time uh, the statement is I have the right to unpaid leave when undergoing fertility treatment. So again, you've got a choice of true or false when it comes to this question. And let's have a few seconds just for people to be able to make their selection. At least it's simple to answer yes or no, true or false. So here we go. 66% um, of you say true and 34% of you say false. Um, and the answer is false. Um, there is no right to paid or unpaid time off. Um, some employers give this as a benefit, although they're not obliged to. Um, if you become pregnant through um, IVF, you have all the same pregnancy and maternity rights as non-IVF pregnancies. Um, and your employer should really treat medical appointments for IVF treatment like any other medical appointment. Similarly, if you're off sick due to the side effects of IVF, your employer should treat that absence the same as they would treat any sick leave. Um, some employers have policies and they are um, setting out um, some rights to time off for people to investigate IVF treatment and, and so on. And I think if it's definitely worth if you put if, if an employer doesn't have those kind of policies, still talking about that, because, you know, allowing someone to make some time up or work flexibly can be quite uh, reasonable and easy to do. Um, and also, um, you know, giving people some paid special leave might be a, a generous and possible option as well. Of course, people are protected from discrimination on gender grounds. And, you know, if the IVF is, is successful on pregnancy grounds um, and in fact, you, the, that protection, the pregnancy protection actually takes place from the last part of the IVF process, embryo transfer, it's called, when somebody might become pregnant. Um, obviously, people don't have to tell their employer, um, but it's helpful if people do, they might enable them to have some support. And if the employer, you know, knows someone is pregnant, then of course they're protected against unfair dismissal and unfair treatment related to that uh, pregnancy. If the IVS is unsuccessful, IVF, sorry, is unsuccessful, then someone is still protected by law against uh, pregnancy discrimination for two weeks after finding out that the embryo transfer um, wasn't successful. Um, so there's lots of guidance on this as well. I've put one up there um, with workingfamilies.org. The EHRC has also a statutory code of practice, and it talks about, you know, responding positively for requests for time off, not treating people less favourably. Um, and after the embryo has been implanted, obviously all the legal rights to pregnancy protection apply let you know no unfavorable treatment um, time off for antenatal care would become applicable so lots of uh, of the standard rights would come into into play um, I think it's good practice for employers to treat requests for time off for IVF positively and sympathetically 
you know, this isn't something that's, you know, completely unusual. It's it's a fairly regular occurrence and, and particularly for some uh, families as well. Which brings us on to thinking about a couple of future points. Um, next year, all the normal increases to the statutory rates, you know, like SSP and maternity and paternity and so on, will take place. But there are also two possible changes to family friendly rights as well. And the first of first of the, the two actually relates to that poll question because it's time off for fertility treatment. So this is to be confirmed, obviously, for 2023, and it is a private members bill um, introduced, but it does seek to allow um, couples to have specific time off work for fertility treatment, including IVF, obviously. Um, and uh, currently, of course, as I've just explained, there is no absolute right for that. And currently, any legal recourse against unfair treatment only applies after implantation has taken place. And another aspect of this bill is that, that that protection from less favorable treatment, detriment, dismissal and discrimination should apply before that point. So a few extensions to our current legislation for that private members bill. And the second private members bill is about bereavement, leave and pay for stillborn and miscarried babies. Again, this is yet to be, to, um, to be confirmed for 2023. It's another private members bill. Um, MP Sarah Owen introduced um, this one. And uh, she said to the Commons, I can't believe in 2021, people are still forced to take sick leave to process their grief. And, and her bill would extend the entitlement to parental bereavement leave and pay to parents of babies miscarried early in pregnancy, whereas our current legislation gives uh, some rights at, if that takes place at 24 weeks or later um, in pregnancy. And her bill had its second reading. Oh no, it's had its first reading. Its second reading will be next February. So a fair way to go for both of these. Um, so the other thing I really need to mention is, um, and, and it's my final point on the future, is that there is still no news and there was no mention um, at all um, of the employment bill in the Queen's speech this year. So where did it go? Um, it's been talked about for so long. It's almost something that's kind of standard on every year's update. Um, but there's you know, no news on this at all. It was legislative reform that the government committed to um, and we expected to see it some time ago. Just to remind you, it includes, if and when it does happen, um, changes to flexible working. So the change is to make flexible working a day one right for employees, whereas con currently someone has to have 26 weeks continuous service to make a, a request for flexible working. So that's the flexible working point to make it a day one right rather than rather than a 26 week right. And um, then it included redundancy protection. Um, and this was to extend the protection to pregnant workers by adding a further six months to a mother's protection after maternity leave ends. So changes to redundancy in those circumstances. There was a, a part about carers leave. So this was giving carers the right to a week's unpaid leave. And there was extensions to sexual harassment, which included you know, creating a duty for employers to prevent sexual harassment from third parties, which we had many years ago and then was repealed, but it, it was bringing that back and extending the time limit for claims from, um, three months to six months. So at the moment, if someone has a claim of sexual harassment, they need to bring a claim to the tribunal within three months of that act. And this part of the bill would extend that and allow someone to, to have a longer period to decide whether or not to bring a claim. So from three months to six months. Um, there was a section about NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, restricting the use of NDAs sometimes known as gagging clauses um, in settlement agreements. Um, so that's still uh, not law. And then finally, there was a section on neonatal care. And this was giving the right to 12 weeks paid neonatal uh, leave to parents 
of babies that needed that kind of neonatal care. There's been a slight bit of movement on this. Um, the neonatal care leave and pay bill did get government backing on the 15th of July this year, but obviously there's still a way to go. If it becomes legislation, it will allow um, parents whose babies need that kind of care to have 12 weeks paid leave in addition to statutory maternity or paternity leave. And that right will be available from day one. Uh, so no minimum uh, qualifying service required. Um, it will apply to parents of babies who are admitted to hospital up to the age of 28 days. And it will apply to babies who need to stay in hospital for seven days continuously or more. These re reforms could be introduced together or as separate bits of legislation piecemeal rather than in a new kind of employment bill but we just simply have no news um they haven't gone away but there's just no movement so again i think we just need to watch and wait on that one okay um our next part of the agenda is to give you an overview of employee rights at work and the first thing I really want to mention here is how much more aware people are than ever before. And um, there's information that you can find everywhere on the Internet. I'm sure you've made use of it yourself. Sometimes it's really accurate and really helpful. And, you know, I've seen lots of um, examples of where people have gained really good knowledge by doing a search. And other times, you know, it can lead to kind of misunderstandings and assumptions that can be quite unhelpful. In fact, I'd love a pound for every time someone has presented a fact to me that actually turned out to be a myth or kind of a half truth. Um, so I thought, well, we thought it might be useful to give a bit of a brief run through and an overview of what employee rights people do have and maybe bust a few myths in that process. So that brings me, I think it's to our next, yes, to our next poll question. So question three, um, no employment protection exists until the day I start work for a new employer. So is it true and false that there is no employment protection until you actually start a new job? So again, we'll have 30 seconds, uh, true or false. Here we go. So our stats are changing. We've got 15% um, say it's true that there is no employment protection, but by far the majority, 85% say it's false, which must mean there is employment protection. And the majority in this example um, have it. So it is false. There may not be much, but what is uh, present is pretty significant. Um, because it relates primarily to discrimination and therefore getting that wrong can be very expensive. As I'm sure you're aware, discrimination claims come with unlimited compensation. Um, so let's look at exactly what those um, rights are. So um, a couple of things to mention here. So people have access to personal data under the provisions of GDPR, and, and that can include interview notes on their recruitment file. So we need to ensure that this uh, personal data gathered as part of someone's application or someone's recruitment process is protected, is processed you know, fairly, securely processed and only used appropriately within you know, the uh, requirements of the Data Protection Act and, and not kept for longer than is necessary either. There's also the right to be forgotten as part of the legislation, so we shouldn't just keep uh, information indefinitely. I always reflect back on a case in Guernsey back in 2016 when I think about um, you know, recruitment and what people should or shouldn't write as part of interview processes. This was a case where the managing director was recruiting and uh, he employed someone and the respondent in question um, was um, well, found that he had made quite insulting and gender specific comments um, on several occasions, including on her own uh, CV. So shortly after she started work, she found her CV in a pile of documents on this managing director's desk. 
And on it, he had noted when he interviewed her the following. He put red lipstick, nice. Um, high heels, good. Tattoos, I do not approve. And then finally, she was wearing a dress. That's really excellent, which is all very creepy and slightly odd. Um, she also stated that this uh, managing director remarked after interviewing another person. So she's employed by this point. He's interviewing for a different role. He then comes and talks to her about the interview and remarks um, about the woman he's just interviewed. We definitely can't hire her. She's far too ugly and overweight. I only want to look at beautiful women. Um, so pretty um, obviously not appropriate. And in fact, she was successful in her sexual harassment claim and was compensated uh, 10,500 pounds in compensation. She was only there a very short amount of time. I'm always saying to my clients, really think about what you write and what you put in emails. I've seen it cause so many problems, not just the issue of sending the email to the wrong people, which is a endless risk with um, sending emails, um, but just should you have to disclose it, would you want that to be read out loud or would you want the person you were writing about to, to see it? I get so many emails that I then end up phoning the client and saying, I really don't think you should put that kind of thing in an email. You probably shouldn't say it, um, to be perfectly honest. So it's always worth when you're writing, think really carefully, would I be happy for this person to read what I'm writing? So that's uh, the first point. Secondly, when it comes to uh, pre-employment, People have the right not to be discriminated against or harassed in connection with their application. So you need to think, you know, wording of job adverts and job descriptions. You need to think shortlisting and interviewing and make sure there's no discrimination that creeps into the, that part of the recruitment process. And people can't be unlawfully discriminated in relation to nine protected characteristics at any stage of the recruitment life cycle or their employment. Um, and that also includes whether they're employed or not in the first place. And um, just to give you a reminder of what those nine protected characteristics are, just in case you um, have forgotten them, they are protection against uh, gender or sex discrimination, pregnancy and maternity discrimination, marital and civil, par civil partnership status, sexual orientation, protection against uh, race discrimination, religion and belief, protection against disability discrimination, age discrimination, and transgender discrimination, which case law in previous years um, has shown includes non-binary and gender fluid discrimination as well. Um, additionally, we have the right not to be refused employment on the grounds of trade union membership or non-membership, should that be relevant to your organisation. Um, but obviously, protecting people from discrimination um, applies to all stages to their employment, um, right through to the termination. And that includes um, direct or indirect discrimination, as well as any harassment and victimisation. The other thing worth remembering thinking about recruitment is also that somebody with a disability may also need reasonable adjustments to enable them to be the successful candidate and be employed and um, you know perform well in the role. So we need to think about that as part of the recruitment exercise as well. And then I suppose the final point to mention is that when we're deciding what to pay people and um, the equal pay obligations are there which require employees of the opposite sex to be that are doing the same broadly similar or work of similar value or work rated as equivalent to be paid the same. So we've got to look out for that gender equal pay issue as well. And also, let's not forget the status issues. If we employ people on fixed term or part time contracts, they should be no less favorably treated than someone that's comparable, i.e. a permanent or full-time person. And that relates to pay as well as benefits and training opportunities um, and all sorts of things. So um, quite, a few, quite a lot to think about before someone even joins um, as part of the recruitment process. 
When it comes to their day one um, rights, obviously the first one and the one that you're probably most familiar with is that employees and workers too must be given a written statement of the main terms and conditions of their employment. And that um, became a day one right back in April 2020. And most people think of this document as the employment contract, but it isn't. An employment contract is normally much broader. There's a very specific list of things that must go into a statement of main terms and conditions of employment. This is section one of the Employment Rights Act. Um, I've put up there on the screen where you can find out exactly what should be included. Um, but it's the basic things. Often you see them in an offer letter, to be honest, um, that should go into this document. It's the, you know, it should include the employer's name, the worker's name, their start date, um, job title or a brief description of the role, the employee's address, the employer's um, place of work, where they're likely to be working, how much pay they're going to receive, how often they get paid. You know, is it last Friday in every calendar month or whatever? It has to specify their working hours. Um, holiday and holiday pay needs to be specified. Sick pay. Um, any other paid leave needs to be set out as well as uh, benefits, whether they're um, but uh, contractual benefits as well as non-contractual benefits as well. Notice needs to be specified. Um, how long the contract is likely to last? Is it indefinite, permanent, or is it fixed term in some way? Uh, whether there's probationary period, how long that is, and the conditions that apply to that. Whether the employee will be required to work abroad, and training that must be completed by the employee as well. So there's lots of things that need to be set out in that principal statement. And then the legislation also says that some terms can be provided later, so don't have to be day one. Um, so they can be, I think they, they describe it as being supplied in instalments. So later you can give pension arrangements, um, terms and conditions that apply to any collective agreements. Collective agreements are where there's union recognition, uh, details of training that's not compulsory, and also disciplinary and grievance rules. So to be sure that you're compliant, go and have a look at the, um, the government website. But I'm pretty sure if you've got a well-formulated contract, it will incorporate all these requirements of the main terms and conditions of employment. OK, the next thing we need to mention uh, that applies from day one is that there are obviously uh, minimum requirements when it comes to pay. And um, from someone's first day, people have certain legal rights. And the most uh, well known one, of course, is the national minimum wage. That is dependent on age, as I'm, hopefully you're aware. If, if someone is 23 plus years old, then it's currently £9.50 an hour goes down according to age to the 16 and 17 year olds that get £4.81 an hour. Um, so, you know, make sure that uh, as a very minimum, you're complying with the national minimum wage. People also have a right from day one of their employment to receive an itemised pay slip that shows gross pay, deductions and net pay. Uh, they have the right not to have uh, unauthorised deductions made from their pay not to be um, uh, you know, unfairly treated by any agreed unlawful deductions. So you need to think about uh, what your contracts say about that. Uh, people have the right to be paid for accrued but untaken statutory annual leave um, and to be paid it on termination of employment and then statutory sick pay. In theory, statutory sick pay is probably a day four right um, because it's paid after the fourth day. Um, but, you know, statutory sick pay comes into a play pretty early on. OK, um, moving forward, still on day one rights. I'm sure you're curious as to why a leaf might be um, relevant. I've got to be honest, I asked someone to, um, and I won't name people to, to protect them, to find a royal, all my photos are royalty free photos. But I, all I wrote on the slide was insert picture for leaf. 
and this is what I got and it's not even spelt the same way but anyway it made me laugh autumn is coming so I decided to leave it in there so what are the leave rights that people have from day one and the first and obvious one is paid annual leave 5.6 weeks or 28 days for full-time workers that's from their start of employment remember in the first year people can only take annual leave which has accrued at the time they want to take the holiday. In subsequent years, they get the whole entitlement on day one, if you like, but in the first year it accrues as people work. Um, apart from uh, holiday or annual leave, there's maternity and family leave that applies from day one too. So employees are entitled to take 52 weeks maternity or adoption leave. And an employer must ensure that they are able to return to their same job when they come back. And this applies even if someone is pregnant when they join. Um, people also have the right to take some paid time off for antenatal appointments. Partners can have some unpaid time off uh, for antenatal appointments too. All employees are entitled to unpaid time off to deal with unexpected emergencies involving family members, that one's called um, dependent leave. Obviously, there's lots of detail to these different uh, leave requirements, uh, which I, I'm not setting out for you because we simply won't have the time. If you want more detail and don't have it already, ACAS is a great source of information and um, .gov.uk sets out all the um, statutory kind of minimum rights in detail as well. While we're talking about leave, um, there's also the right to time off for breaks um, during someone's working day. Uh, so an employer is legally obliged to provide an unpaid 20 minute break after working for six hours, um, as well as daily rest breaks of 11 hours in every 24. And employees are also entitled to a weekly rest break of one day off in every 14 as well. So there's lots of different um, obligations on um, kind of those breaks in working hours and also the working day and the working week. So again, if unsure, check and uh, make sure you're compliant with those too. Okay, then just a couple more um, day one rights for you, the final few um, of the kind of key ones. Disciplinary and grievances apply from day one insofar as in the event of a disciplinary or grievance hearing or meeting, the employee has the right to be accompanied by a colleague or trade union re representative at <clears throat> excuse me, any formal hearing. So that's a day one right. And um, then we've also got whistleblowing rights. So an employee is protected against detriment or dismissal due to whistleblowing from their first day of employment. We've got the right to uh, belong to a trade union as I mentioned earlier, and take part in industrial action and to not suffer a detriment or dismissal for any union-related reason uh, from day one. If there is any TUPI issues, which is the transfer of undertakings, protection of employment that can apply when one uh, employer takes over another, for example, or part of another organisation, then people have the right to be informed and consulted about any proposed TUPI transfers and collective redundancies. Um, so that's the right to be informed and consulted, not to redundancy pay. That's not a day one right. And then finally, there are some health and safety uh, rights. All employees, uh, workers, regardless of time served, are entitled to be protected under the Health and Safety at Work Act of 1974. And that's a kind of general duty that the employer will take reasonable steps to ensure the health and safety of those at work. Okay, so that's our uh, principal day one rights. Let's move on to month one <clears throat> rights, excuse me. So after a month service, um, if an employee is forced to stop working uh, for a couple of reasons, there's a right to be paid. So the first one is the right to be paid if suspended on medical grounds. Now there are certain limited circumstances that apply to this. So I've put in, <coughs> excuse me, a link for you. And also um, there's the paid right to statutory layoff and short time working. But again, that's only if that's contractually agreed to. 
Um, and that's um, that was particularly relevant during COVID when the furlough um, obligations came in or options came in because some people had the right to impose short time or layoffs and others didn't. And it did depend on what, what the contractual wording was. The other rights that follow being employed for um, a month are that everyone, have, every employee has to be given at least a week's notice of dismissal. So if you are classed as an employee, have worked for at least a month, then there is statutory minimum notice periods um, should somebody's employment be terminated. So if someone's been employed for one month up to two years, then they are entitled to one week's notice from their employer. And then from two years up to 12 years, it's a week in addition for each full year that they've worked. So 12 years or more continuous service equates to 12 weeks notice. So for example, if, a, if someone, if an employee has worked for four years and nine months, they are entitled to a minimum notice period of four weeks. Now, of course, employment contracts um, or policy can be more generous, can give longer notice periods. That's called contractual notice. What I've just described to you is called statutory notice. So you can give more, you just can't give less. On the other hand, the amount of notice required by an employee to give to their employer is different. So again, an employer's contract could set out what the notice period is, but the statutory notice for employer employee to give their employer is only ever one week once they have a month's service. Um, I think it's good practice to set out clearly what notice is required. And also remember this only applies from having one month's continuous service. You could set out that there is no notice pre start date or even no notice in the first month of employment. Now, I know quite a, a lot of um, job offers were withdrawn, particularly over the more, most difficult part of the pandemic, where people had been given a job offer and then later the business realised they couldn't support their employment and withdrew it. And if you withdraw a job offer after it's been accepted, then the notice has to be given. Of course, if the notice clause is that there's no notice, it costs nothing. If, however, the, the contract just said, you know, you'll be entitled to, you know, one month's notice, then one month needed to be paid. So it's really kind of a sensible thing to do to just be clear what the notice obligations are. OK, <laughs> excuse me. Um, let's go on then to look at the next one, which is the 26 weeks uh, service and longer. So more employee rights apply at this point, and they, they kind of focus around parental uh, needs. So first of all, once someone has 26 weeks continuous service, they have the right to request, but it's only to request, it's not to be granted, they have the right to request flexible working. And um, they also have the right to take paternity leave, which, you know, is one or two weeks um, uh, paternity leave. And if eligible, they have the right to shared parental leave um, as well. And um, then a few more pay rights apply from this point onwards. So, for example, statutory maternity pay uh, comes into effect when someone has 26 weeks service or more. And um, that, that's a total of 39 weeks, six weeks at 90% of average earnings, and then 33 weeks at the statutory rate. Statutory maternity pay is £156.66 at the moment. Um, and that's if they have 26 weeks service by the 15th week before the baby is due, before the date of confinement. Similar with statutory adoption pay. Also, as I've mentioned, paternity uh, pay, shared parental leave pay, bereavement uh, leave and pay. There's lots of rules, eligibility, notice requirements to all of these things. Um, and again, go to gov.uk or ACAS if you want more detail. Of course, employers can do better, again, than the statutory minimums. And if they do, an employer can also uh, contractually dictate um, if they recover 
uh, additional payments if the employee doesn't return to work as well. So there's a lot more freedom as to how to construct more generous terms and policies when it comes to uh, those that go above the statutory minimums. OK, now we're on to one year. Um, so the basic and main uh, kind of new right for once somebody has one year's continuous service is that they become eligible for unpaid parental leave of up to 18 weeks unpaid leave for a child who is under the age of 18. And that's taken in blocks of a week and no more than four weeks in any year unless agreed otherwise. So again, if you want the detail of the rules, please go and have a look. But this is taken in respect of each child that's under the age of 18, um, as long as it's taken before the child's 18th birthday. Um, and there's significant you know, obligations on how you request this leave. It has to be requested at least 21 days beforehand. And also parents with um, disabled children who are entitled to a disability living allowance or some sort of personal independence payments, they can take their unpaid parental leave in single days rather than in blocks of a week. So slightly different rules in that respect. Um, so that's the kind of principle day one uh, right that applies. Um, and then we've got what happens after two years. Um, and this is the final date in our kind of journey in someone's employment life cycle. So after two years continuous service, the critical employment right arrives, uh, which is protection against unfair dismissal, whether that's for conduct or performance or absence or redundancy and so on. Um, as I said earlier, if the reason for someone's dismissal relates to discrimination or to taking one of those kind of statutory parental rights, among other things, the two years uh, minimum service requirement to bring a claim of unfair dismissal does not apply. These are things called automatic unfair dismissals. But if it is a straightforward, non-automatically unfair dismissal, then two years service is necessary in order to bring a claim to the employment tribunal. That is after someone has gone through the process of ACAS and you know, brought their claim on time and so on and so forth. Um, so dismissals after two years service have to be both substantially and procedurally fair according to the type of dismissal, as I said, whether it's you know, a misconduct dismissal or whether it's a redundancy um, dismissal. Also, from this point, from two years onwards, written reasons for dismissal also apply. Um, so pre two years service, there is no legal obligation for an employer to tell an employee why they are being dismissed. It would be really awful and quite strange to approach somebody who'd been employed by you for, you know, 20 months and just say, we're going to let you go today and pay you in lieu of your notice. Um, and when that person says, but why? I love working here. The response is just, well, you're not actually legally entitled to a reason. So be gone. I mean, that's so unreasonable. Um, as to be unlikely, but it's also not unlawful. Um, it's just most employers, I don't think, would behave that way. Of course, if someone is dismissed for pregnancy or maternity reasons, they're always entitled to a reason. But um, written reasons for dismissal otherwise only apply when someone has two years or more service. The other one obviously relates to redundancy, as I mentioned. So people have the right to redundancy pay when they have two years or more um, continuous service and redundancy pay is calculated according to the statutory formula. It depends on the age and length of employment. Um, and also people from two years onwards also have uh, time off rights prior to be made redundant to look for alternative work or attend uh, training. So I've tried to kind of hopefully break these down into, you know, pre-employment, day one, month one, 26 weeks, two years, as these are the principal um, points uh, that new rights come into play. Um, but as I said, all of this is set out for you um, on .gov.uk if you want more information. OK, we're at 10 o'clock, which is a good and logical time to have our first break. 
So I think uh, we'll take 15 minutes. And if you just join back at 10.15, that would be great. Any questions, put them in the Q&A and I'll try and pick up on some uh, when we come back. But time for you to you know, have a cup of break, get a cup of tea and uh, I'll see you shortly. So thank you very much. Okay, um, I hope you all managed to have a quick break. I've just been looking at some of the questions, so I thought maybe it might be sensible to pick up on a couple. So um, I think back when I was talking about um, right to work checks, a question came in, can we no longer do these over a Zoom call? And the answer is that <clears throat> the change does come into effect from the 1st of October. So we've had that extension till the end of September, and then it goes back to what it was before physical checks from the 1st of October, unless of course, something happens in the meantime. So hopefully that answers um, that point, but keep up to date with the gov.uk site, as I explained, it, it shows all the, the changes and what's new on there. Um, and then there's a couple of questions on the Q&A. So the first one was, um, is someone allowed paid leave to attend a hospital outpatient appointment? And this is where you go back to what your contractual um, sick pay um, uh, regu um, uh, contractual rights are under for sick pay or in any sick pay policy. So um, you would look at whether you would get enhanced sick pay or whether it would be statutory sick pay, depending on what the appointment is and, and what it's for and so on and so forth. So that will you know, very much depend on what the issue is and then also what the contractual obligation is. Um, the next question was about um, convictions under the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act. Um, and yes, you're absolutely right. It's a good point. The Rehabilitation of Offenders legislation, as this is very old legislation, 1974 originally, allows some people to have what's deemed to a, a spent conviction after a certain period of time known as the rehabilitation period. And what that means is that they don't have to, in certain circumstances, reference that as part of the recruitment exercise. But, um, for example, it depends on the sentence and, um, and how long since that sentence has been completed. So if someone has a sentence, um, there's different periods of time. So, for example, if it was a custodial sentence of up to six months, then what the legislation says is that it is deemed spent six months from the date upon which that sentence was completed. So there are um, obligations on employers here when it comes to rehabilitation of offenders. Again, the details are on the gov.uk website if you want to familiarise yourself with that. It does also depend on the role that someone undertakes as to whether a conviction can be spent or not. Um, and then the final question was about temporary workers um, and what entitlements they have, and the question included redundancy. Um, so there are rights for agency workers and the rights apply if they've worked for the same employer for 12 weeks or longer. It's called the 12 week minimum qualifying period. And if that's the case, then people have the rights to equivalent pay, holiday, sick uh, leave, working hours and rest breaks, um, even access to permanent jobs um, advertised, permanent job vacancies, as well as some parental time off. So this, um, this is an additional obligation for agency workers. I was focusing mostly on employees, but again, if you employ agency workers, double check what those rights are. ACAS have a very good uh, page set out to what agency workers' rights are. Um, and what the pay rights are, I mean, it obviously includes national minimum wage, not to have unlawful deductions and so on, receive a pay slip, you know, so a lot of it is the same as that which we've been talking about. Um, and there are also rights to, you know, the same holiday and, you know, those kind of things as well. Um, 
so yeah agency workers have a check on what those obligations are there are some day one rights there are some 12 week uh, rights also applies to sick pay you know what are the pension implications what are the rest breaks um and so on and so forth so yeah good points and um, they're not just employees in those um in those examples so thank you for that Okay, let's um, move onwards then. So we've looked at um, some of the key rights for people. One of the things I want to mention before I move on is that there are, as, as, as we just picked up with agency workers there, for example, different rights for people with different employment status, whether that's their agency workers, whether they're you know, part time, whether they're fixed term, um, you know, we need to make sure we get the status of everyone that works for us correctly, because it does make a difference to people's entitlements. And back on the 26th of July, the government published a really detailed guidance for the first time, which is worth having a look at if you have these kind of atypical people in your organisation as to how to establish who's an employee, who's a worker, who's self-employed and so on. And then uh, once you've established the right status, what that means in terms of uh, rights for people. It's worth mentioning that we've had a couple of interesting cases um, that relate to this area this year. So Smith and Plimlico Plumbers. Um, Mr Smith was a worker who claimed back pay for six years worth of unpaid um, annual leave that he'd taken. So he was identified by Plimlico Plumbers as self-employed. Um, he brought a claim and eventually it was decided that he wasn't self-employed at all. He was a worker. And you've probably read lots of these um, in, the, in the press from Uber onwards. Um, so the EAT and the Employment Tribunal before that dismissed his claims originally, holding that they were out of time and that he could only claim for annual leave that had not been taken as a result of his employer's refusal to pay leave that he'd requested. However, the Court of Appeal reversed those lower courts and decisions and reasoned that an employee should carry over and claim for unpaid annual leave unless the employer could show three things. And the three things were, did the employer openly and transparently give that person the opportunity to take paid leave? Did the employer encourage that person to take that leave? And did the employer inform that person that the leave would be lost at the end of the year if it was not used? So three principal obligations. So this case is really important for any employers who have wrongly assessed people as self-employed contractors, particularly uh, because if those individuals can establish that they're in fact workers, they might be able to claim back holiday pay from when they first started work. Now, in this case, I think it was six years. Although he brought his claim in 2011, it's been a 10 year journey for Mr. Smith. Uh, Plimlico Plumbers maintained that he was never a worker or an employee. And of course that failed for them. Um, what's come back this year is whether he should get all his holiday pay. Um, and the answer is that he was entitled to it back to when he first joined. So a few key points to take away from this Court of Appeal decision. Firstly, um, if you're engaging a self-employed contractor, you obviously, if they're genuinely self-employed, you don't have to give them any rights to take paid annual leave. If you employ workers, then obviously you do. Um, the relevant portion of annual leave is the EU-derived EU four weeks, not the full 5.6 weeks. So what we're talking about here is four weeks every year, not 5.6. But the rule on giving this leave applies to both any untaken portion of that four weeks um, and um, as well as the taken portion, if you see what I mean. So it applies to both anything that wasn't taken as well as what was taken. All of those that entitlement to four weeks should be paid. So there's no time restriction on the period of carryover for this. Compensation can be sought for many years. If someone was engaged for 10 years and didn't receive any paid leave in that period, they could claim 40 weeks 
normal pay as compensation. So it can be quite expensive if, if you get this wrong. It's never a defence for an employer to say, oh, I honestly believe they were self-employed. They said they were self-employed. Doesn't matter. What is the correct legal status for that individual? So look at your atypical um, uh, workers and make sure that you're giving them what they're entitled to. Um, so as an employer, we've always got to be able to demonstrate those three things that I mentioned earlier, that we've specifically and transparently given the worker the opportunity to take their four weeks paid annual leave, or actually the 5.6 weeks, which we're entitled to in the UK. Um, so the four weeks is only for the claims, that we've encouraged them to take that paid annual leave and inform them that it would be lost if they don't take it. And I think we should have a process where that, that happens automatically, not just for those people as well. Let's do it for our uh, you know, normal uh, employed people as well. And um, then while also talking about holiday pay, another case that's really current and new that hit the press a, a few months ago, <clears throat> which was about the correct method of calculating weekly pay and therefore holiday pay, for part year workers this time. And this is the case of Harper Trust and Brazel. So this is term time workers, for example. So people that are permanently employed, but only work part of the year. Um, so in this case, Mrs. Brazel was a visiting music teacher um, by the Harper Trust, and she was employed under a permanent contract and usually worked between 10 and 15 hours a week, sometimes less, um, and was never required to work during school holidays. So part year workers are entitled to 5.6 weeks holiday, um, not pro rata. And that's the important finding of this legislation is even though they're not working the full year, the 5.6 weeks cannot be pro rata. So the amount of holiday pay has to be calculated looking at the average of the most recent 12 weeks of their earnings but when you look at 12 weeks, if some of that has been holiday time, you take those weeks out and look at earlier weeks. So you have to look at 12 weeks in which there were earnings. You ignore weeks where there are zero earnings. So whilst this decision only really impacts those engaged on permanent but part year working, it's obviously of significant um, interest to the education sector but part year working or part time uh, working for term time is quite popular in other organisations as well. Um, so it will impact those workers too. Doesn't affect your normal part time workers, just these part year workers. And in fact, they'll end up being better off. Um, so and the Supreme Court said that, it, that they didn't really have any regard to the fact that it slightly favoured these atypical patterns that shouldn't change what the legislation says in that everybody should have 5.6 weeks of holiday pay. So there we go two um, kind of interesting cases on um, calculating holiday slightly out of the norm. OK, let's um, move on. So, you know, just an important point really there just to check the status and therefore what the rights are that people have at work. And so on to our next section, which is the hot topics and trends. And I've picked um, kind of seven to look at in a bit more detail. So firstly, we're going to look at COVID. Um, I'm sorry, having said, you know, it's awful to keep talking about COVID, it is still a hot topic, so we do need to talk about it. So I'm going to look at vaccines as well as um, long COVID. We've had a recent case on that. Um, next, we're going to touch on menopause, um, definitely in the news a lot um, and has been for a while. Uh, then just to uh, finish talking about home and hybrid working, and I'll also touch on the four day working week that's been trialled in the UK at the moment as well. And then we'll look at the impact of working overseas. Again, kind of an, an impact of the pandemic was some people headed off outside of the UK. Um, and what are the impacts and what are the effects of them working overseas? The fifth one I'm going to look at is the great resignation and the quiet quitting. So we've got two uh, kind of topics to talk about under that one. Uh, and then employee well-being 
and um, lastly, the cost of living crisis. So we've got a few issues to think about. I've not mentioned diversity and inclusion in that hot topic list. It should always be on your hot topic list, I think, but no reason to specifically highlight something at this point in time. OK, let's um, go forwards. So COVID. Um, important question I get asked quite a lot, actually, is can we require our employees to be vaccinated? Now, as a starting point, we've got to recognise that there is no you know, legal obligation in the UK to be vaccinated. And in the absence of such a legal requirement, it is difficult, not impossible, but it is difficult for an employer to force employees to be vaccinated without their consent. Um, so an employer who requires employees to receive a vaccination um, would, you know, needs to be quite careful about, you know, whether that obligation arises from something that's, you know, an absolutely mm -hmm. essential um, obligation for safety in particular in that workplace, because I think there is risk of clearly risk of discrimination if someone has objected on, on the grounds of a protected characteristic, disability, age, religion or belief, for example. Um, and there will only be a small number of circumstances that that, that may apply. Um, if an employer were to dismiss an employee for their refusal to have the vaccine, clearly they're opening themselves up to the potential of an unfair dismissal claim. Of course, now we know uh, if that person has two years service. So a requirement for an employee to be vaccinated could amount to a repudiatory breach of contract as well. So if that requirement were imposed, it could give rise to constructive unfair dismissal claims too. So good policy, clear business reason um, is an essential starting point. Obviously, employers do have an obligation to take reasonable care of other employees. So often this is part of risk assessments. Um, and if the objection to vaccination seems unreasonable, then the employer, before they take any action, would need to demonstrate that there's no other way um, to objectively deal with the safety issues other than, you know, dismissing or failing to employ a, an individual. So obviously this depends on the circumstances, the role, the organisation, the reasons for refusal, the risks and all the rest of it. I just the point I'm trying to make is it's definitely not a straightforward one. Um, it's worth mentioning that there has been um, one of the first decisions on this uh, published this year. Um, and in this case, a tribunal decided that an employee who had been dismissed for refusing to receive the vaccine had in fact been fairly dismissed. So this was one of those extreme cases where it turned out to be um, fair. Now, this goes back to January 2021, and this care home um, was um, where Miss Allett uh, worked, and she'd been employed there for uh, some time, and she refused to um, have the vaccine, even though her employer had explained that it was safe and that it was necessary to protect staff and care home residents and she was consequently taken through a disciplinary procedure and eventually dismissed for refusing to follow a reasonable management instruction. Um, the Employment Tribunal dismissed her unfair dismissal claim and found that in these circumstances, requiring the vaccination was a reasonable management instruction and therefore refusing it amounted to, in fact, gross misconduct. And um, this is a first instance decision. It's a tribunal decision. Um, but, you know, and I think it's definitely clear to say that refusing to have the vaccine will not make it fair to dismiss people in all circumstances, however it was in this case. Um, the owners in this case um, began consulting with staff because mm. their insurance had said that they would not cover them if um, any staff contracted COVID and died at work or if they gave them to residents who died. And days before the vaccines were due to be administered, the home did suffer a big outbreak 
and quite a number of residents died with and, and at that time nearly half of their staff were isolating at home so that's why the the owners in this case decided to make the vaccine compulsory and then challenged this individual because she was objecting so there are some kind of extreme um situations in in this case but you know it is an example of where it was fair to dismiss um, I want to mention another case to you as well. Um, this is um, the where the impact of um, COVID was long term for someone. So this is a long COVID case, um, Burke and Turning Point, um, Scotland. So this is where consideration was given to whether um, an employee with long COVID systems was disabled within the meaning of the Equality Act of 2010. Uh, this person had been employed as a caretaker since November 2001. In 2020, in November 2020, he tested positive. Um, apparently, his symptoms were mild to start with, but then he they got more serious and he developed um, you know, difficulty sleeping and great fatigue um, and all sorts of other kind of complications that related and affected his daily activities. Um, he was off work from the November 2020, and there were two occupational health reports produced, both which stated that he was actually fit to work and that the disability provisions of the Equality Act did not apply. This is despite his medical fit notes stating that he had uh, long COVID and post-viral fatigue syndrome. Um, to cut a long story short, he was eventually dismissed in, October, in August 2021 due to his ill health because his employer could see no reasonable prospect of a return to work in a reasonable time frame. So he brought claims, unfair dismissal, dis disability discrimination and so on. And the tribunal in this case concluded that he was in fact disabled with long COVID during the relevant period. He had physical impairments, which resulted in this post-viral fatigue syndrome. It did affect his normal day-to-day -day activities. The effect was more than minor or trivial, and it was also long-term because it had lasted for more than 12 months. So this case really demonstrates careful consideration for any long COVID uh, cases because they may be disabilities when assessed under the Equality Act. Of course, it always comes down to particular sets of circumstances, um, but you need to be thinking about reasonable adjustments and you know, providing appropriate support uh, to people affected in that way. So two cases that are very kind of relevant to hot topics at the moment. Um, the next one I want to talk about is uh, relates to the menopause. So, um, you know, the world of work has changed substantially, hasn't it? I looked at some statistics recently and in 1992, 21% of employees were aged over 50. Now that is more than 50, uh, 42%. So it's doubled um, in that period of time. In 1971, 37% of employees were women. Now that's 47%. 74% of part-time uh, employees are women. Um, so lots of change here, and it continues to, to change, I think it's safe to say. Um, more of us work part-time, flexibly, from home, and self-employed um, than ever before. And there's been a survey on longevity recently from Stanford that said nearly, uh, I think it was actually it was over 50% of five-year-olds today will expect to live past 100 um, and expect to work for more than 60 years in that period of time. So people are working longer, living longer, and there are more women in the workplace than ever. And this is why we need to make sure we consider uh, menopause-related issues um, at work. Recent stats from the CIPD indicated that 42% of women would consider leaving their job and 20% actually do because of the menopause. Um, and the number of tribunal cases is also increasing regularly uh, that relate to the menopause. Because under the Equality Act, less favourable treatment and detriment 
including up and up to and including dismissal, um, is protected under the grounds of sex, age and disability. So three of those nine protected characteristics could come into play. And obviously there's health and safety issues too. So employers need to make reasonable adjustments and need to you know, make sure that they take appropriate action um, that don't assess whether there is causative links between menopause and employees uh, behavior before taking action and, and don't you know ensure that they, they don't make offhand comments relating to menopause you know those kind of throwaway one-liners allegedly you know comedy moments that you hear all the time so increasingly we're seeing menopause policies we're seeing training and written guidance for managers as to how to support uh, menopausal colleagues training for staff to ensure you know, an inclusive culture and supportive behaviours, um, and having menopause mentors or other support services um, that, that can be offered to employees as well. So because of this, and I'm sure you've seen the number of um, different uh, employment tribunal cases that have been heard too, I think it's something like 13 million women a year may be impacted um, by the menopause between the ages of 45 and 55 broadly um, and that most commonly that can last for 7 to 14 years of course some people have no symptoms at all and then there are some people at the other end of the spectrum that may be admitted to hospital and require operations or other medical treatment um, and also this is a period of time where often women are in their most senior or challenging roles I was really interested to read that Boots the um, health and beauty retailer has announced uh, recently that it will cover the cost of prescriptions for all its employees who take hormone replacement um, treatment, HRT, from April 2020 onwards. And they employ um, 51,000 people and 80% of those are women. And this is part of their move to be more inclusive and open um, in a supportive workplace culture. So I think they envisaged about 8,600 people were currently within that age range and that maybe 15% would be paying for HRT. So um, uh, something really interesting, something new as well. Um, but there's lots of information available for people if you want to know more about what you can do to be supportive and in increase awareness. I do lots of training and development for um, employers Lots of it is about inclusive cultures, about you know, equality, diversity and inclusion. And definitely it's a topic I always cover um, just because it's really important, affects so many people. Um, and it's also very newsworthy um, as well. So I want to be kind of ahead of the curve on, I think. OK, um, my next one is a place of work. So this is kind of my third hot topic, where we work. Um, has become, you know, constantly in the news at the moment with the increase in home and hybrid working in London and the South East. Now between 30 and 40 percent have some home working in their uh, in their role and employee expectation has changed you know, dramatically. I think people want control over their location and their time. You know, I'm often asked, well, if I achieve my output, why can't I open? Uh, why can't I work more freely? And I think it's a, you know, it's a fair point in some roles, in some organisations. Home working obviously brings lots of gains to the individual, a better work life balance, you know, greater flexibility. And for some people, it's far easier to focus with fewer distractions, more time for family and friends, savings on commuting costs, you know, even IT upskilling and, and greater levels of motivation. The focusing one, I think, is a really interesting point. So many more offices are open plan. I often work with one of my clients and go up to their offices, which is this massive open plan space. And nigh on everybody is plugged into earphones or a headset just to try and cope with the amount of noise. You know, having online meetings becomes almost impossible. Um, you know, so there are kind of pros and cons here. There are definitely benefits of flexible working for the employer, you know, savings in office space, higher levels of job satisfaction, reduced absence rates. It's even much easier to recruit 
people. I was trying to help someone uh, recruit an EA, an executive assistant recently, and there wasn't anybody, it was in central London, who would consider applying for that job unless there was you know, an element of hybrid and home working uh, within the role. And hybrid, I guess, is really seen as the best of both worlds, potentially, as there's the you know, benefits from uh, home working, but also working together in person, um, the collaboration, the social aspects for that. And of course, there are some tasks that simply can't be done at home. Um, but, you know, that still has its own difficulty. What days do we ask people to come to the office? Is there even enough seating? Um, you know, this was definitely a, an issue before the pandemic, but COVID definitely sped this up. Um, I think, you know, trial should be your favourite word if it's something new that you're considering and having the right to revert to contractual situate the contractual status for where your place of work is, is, is often an important one to include as well. I don't think you can over communicate, you know, involve people um, and don't forget to look at those contractual situations. Um, when it comes to office space, I have another client of mine that has now got a booking app uh, for all employees. So if they want to come into the office, they have to make sure they book a desk um, because they simply don't have enough room if everybody wants to turn up at the same time. So there are lots of issues here um, to consider. Um, and just running through them, um, just in summary form, think about your HR policies. For example, you know, is home working or flexible working uh, up to date? Is that something that you need to revise? Do we need to make changes or introduce new policies? Are we going to have a company wide approach um, looking at hybrid or agile working? Or are you going to do it on a piecemeal, you know, single make an application for flexible working basis? Um, so it does depend on what you plan to do. Um, how are we going to ensure that people are properly supervised and their performance is properly managed if they're working from home? Um, you know, do, what do we need to think about when it comes to, um, you know, insurance, employers, liability insurance or people's home insurance, you know, those kind of things. What about the health and safety implications? Because we're still responsible for someone's working environment when they work from home. Um, so what about risk assessments? What about equipment and, uh, you know, ensuring people are having their breaks and all the rest of it? Um, what about the impact on confidentiality of client or employee information? How do we ensure that's just as secure as if they were in the workplace? Then there's the whole tax implications you know, what expenses can be occurred? What can people claim for? What does it do to benefits? Um, you know, what about travel to work? Where is the workplace? Um, you know, even the well-being issues, keeping in touch. It's, it's far more difficult. You know, when you're in an office, you can walk past someone, you can detect whether there's a deterioration in, in how someone feels or how they behave. You can grab a quick coffee. You know, out of sight should not be out of mind, and yet often it is. Um, and also, if some people are in the office more often, are they ending up being treated more preferentially? Are they more likely to get the promotions? You know, when you look at who's working from home and who's working at the office, we need to make sure there's no unfairness that creeps into kind of longer term decision making as well. So it's pretty, you know, all encompassing. There's lots to think about. It can be really successful and lots of you may well be doing it. But um, it's only when there are difficulties that you end up looking back at contractual situation and the you know, policies in play. Are those things you know, as watertight as they can be to deal with the difficult issues? Um, it kind of brings me back to just a quick reminder for you on flexible working. So if you've decided to look at this on a kind of individual per person by person basis, and there are obviously has been a huge surge in the number of people making flexible working um, requests, then just, you know, have a reflect back on your policy, make sure that people that are dealing with them understand, you know, in what way that they should be um, considering requests. As I mentioned earlier, people have to have 26 weeks service to ask for flexible working. There's a, an identified number of reasons we can reject a request. 
you know, things like the inability to organize work or the detrimental effect on customer service or that you haven't got other people that can cover the work that that person won't be there to do. Um, but obviously, you know, follow the, pers- the process and the policy, but be careful that, you know, your refusal doesn't turn into an allegation of discrimination, you know, on the grounds of sex, for example, because more requests come from women than men or disability, more people with disability might have a preference to work from home. Um, And obviously it's more difficult to justify turning a request down where they have performed successfully from home over a lengthy period of time um, during COVID. So it makes the argument to show reasonableness more difficult if you haven't properly considered something. And the other thing I would say, two kind of hot tips, I suppose, is consider requests in the order in which they come in, because the more homeworking um, or flexible working you give, the more difficult it, it may be to give other people that same opportunity. Um, so be clear about what order requests come in and deal with them in that way. Consider trial periods. It's so useful to have that. So there's evidence of, yes, it's working or no, it's not working. So I think trial periods are really important. And then finally, when you uh, agree a request, agree it within the role that that person currently holds, because it may be okay to give X flexibility to a person performing Y job. But if they are to move, for example, into X job, would the same flexibility be as um, applicable? So maybe you require people to make another flexible working request if they change role. So when you make agreements, be clear about what you're agreeing to and whether that's role specific or not. Okay, hopefully that's helpful. Um, And it also kind of leads into my um, next point, which is whether or not to consider the four day working week. Um, Now, as you may well have read, it's being trialed by a number of organisations at the moment. Um, And isn't it a great concept to be paid all of your pay and get all of your holiday and all of the perks that come with full time working, but only work, but work, you know, basically one day less a week. Um, I think that's a lovely idea if it were to be successful. And that's what thousands of people in the UK are trialling at the moment. I think the trial started on June the 6th or there or thereabouts. And I think it is the world's largest trial of the four day working week organised by the four day week campaign. Um, I think there's 70 different employers in this trial at the moment. Um, So basically, it's really simple. The four day model is that you get 100% of your pay for 80% of your time, but you've committed to provide 100% of your productivity. Sounds radical. And is it even possible? There needs to be, I think, a fair amount of flex and downtime in someone's day for them to work 80% less, but still have the same output. But there you go. It's been growing in population in popularity, sorry, for the last decade. We've seen trials in Iceland, New Zealand, Japan, even Sri Lanka um, has just approved a four day working week for public sector employers. But I was reading up about this, obviously, in in preparation for this session. And I found that the reason Sri Lanka is doing it is um, to encourage people to take time off work to grow food and to help with their massive fuel shortage. So the reason is not actually to deliver five days of productivity in four. There's other reasons for that. Um, Anyway, it's interesting. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what the results of this um, trial are. But, you know, it's a hot topic because people are talking about it at the moment um, as to whether or not that is going to be something that you might find employees maybe push for. I mean, there are other alternatives available already. Compressed working weeks is really popular. So one day off a week, but I will work my my missing hours, if you like, spread out over the other four Um, or even the. Yeah, you know, spread out over a fortnight. We see that as well. Um, so there are alternatives, but they're not in they're not in the same category at all. Okay, let's try and fit in one more before we have a break. Very much linked to um, where somebody works. So this is about working overseas. 
Um, and as I said to you before, you know, there's an increasing number of people that are arguing, well, I can do my job from anywhere. So why not from, you know, uh, overseas? Um, and there's reasons that you need to think about this really carefully. And they're even broader than just employment uh, based reasons. Um, so it's definitely become something that I would say you must absolutely, before you start agreeing anything, take legal advice because um, working overseas can have implications for personal tax in the new country as well as in the UK. So obviously that's an issue. Um, that affects you know, the individual as well. There are clearly confidential um, issues, data protection issues, client and employee confidentiality issues. Um, there are far more cyber attacks now given the rise of and reliance on technology. So what's the kind of protection that um, we can put in place if someone's working overseas? There are insurance implications if people are working from home. These are the same if they are working also um, overseas. The same for how we manage people and the work that they do. I mean, there's very little opportunity for face-to-face -face contact at all if someone's working overseas. What about the difference in hours and the effect that that has as well? I've worked with one client who has somebody that works in Australia and they went back um, just at the start of the pandemic and have stayed, but they work UK hours, even though they're in Australia. So basically they're kind of upside down working at night and sleeping during the day. So, um, I mean, that's what they've decided, but it does cause issues. There are even issues to think about with corporation tax, you know, issues on profits, what territory was that profit made, even on, in which country was a contract signed um, as well. So um, is England the right jurisdiction for someone's employment contract? Um, you know, what rights apply? Is it home country or is it UK uh, rights? So loads of issues, in other words. I would definitely encourage you to take proper advice before you consider saying yes to someone's request. So I've seen some policies that say no more than four weeks of working abroad are possible, but I would not even consider doing that until you take some advice. And obviously travel is far more frowned upon uh, from a work point of view, an ethical carbon footprint, sustainability point of view. Um, temporary working abroad really probably isn't affected um, by an applicable change in legal regime. Um, but obviously the situation is completely different where someone's typical or usual place of work has shifted overseas as a result of this kind of change. Um, so one, two, definitely think about carefully. And also different countries may have different uh, risks associated with them as well. Um, so that's, you know, and it's not just anywhere overseas, it could be differences for different countries as well. Um, okay, it makes sense for me to stop before I start a new category here. So we're a couple of minutes um, ahead. Uh, let's still come back at quarter past. You just get an extra minute or two with your break um, because it's much more, it's much easier to say come back at quarter past than it is at 13 minutes past. So uh, let's have another short break. I'll see you in another just over 15 minutes and then we'll do the last part of our programme. Thank you very much. Right. Hello, everybody. Hey, welcome back. So I've got a few questions to pick up on. Um, so one of them was, what if the conviction is spent, but will it not be shown on a system check? Can one be rejected from a job, albeit spent, because it appears on a DBS check? please. So um, there is some filtering on DBS checks. I'm no expert in this. It's definitely on the gov.uk website where you can get more information. So I know that, and I think it changed at the end of 2020, there is some filtering on DBS. But I think where a circumstance occurs where something shows up on a DBS, and it is in fact, when you check a spent conviction, then you might not be able to have it removed from the DBS, but you shouldn't let it then affect your recruitment decision. So I guess whoever is the recipient of any DBS needs to be aware that they may need to 
react or respond or deal appropriately with spent convictions that end up being shown on a on a DBS. But, you know, it's a it's a, a detailed point, and I think I would definitely suggest you check on the gov.uk website. But I know that there is some filtering. Um, I think that relates to youth in particular, young people, uh, offences caused when someone was a um, young person. But I, I can't give you any more detail than that. But hopefully that's a little bit helpful. Um, and then... Another question was, does the law permit one to have paid leave or even SSP for a hospital outpatient appointment? And I think we touched on a very similar question before. So um, it depends what the outpatient appointment is for, I think. If it is for medical treatment, then I think that should easily be classified as, you know, sick leave. And therefore, contractually, that either is payable, depending on what the contract says, um, or not. Remember, with SSP, part days are not subject to SSP payments. So even if someone works for a minute before they go home sick, you can't count that as a, as a sick day. But, you know, it would be reasonable if someone was having you know, a short hospital appointment that didn't fall within sick leave for that to, for that person to be able to make that time up. Um, but there's nothing really specific legislated for when it comes to hospital outpatient appointments in particular. Um, so I hope that's a little bit helpful. And then the last one was a good question. Well, they're all good questions, but this is a question related to the case that I was talking about, the Brazel case. So um, the question is, has the 12 weeks um, increased to 52 weeks across 104 worked for holiday calculations? And um, you're quite right. In the Brazel case, that was pre the change in legislation. Um, so then it was the reference period was 12 weeks. But in I think it was April 2020, I'd need to double check that date for you to be absolutely right. The number of weeks in that calculation has now increased um, to 52. So um, when that legislation, when that case was heard, as I uh, recalled it to you, it was 12 weeks, but the law has since changed and it has increased. So um, it's a good point to make that reminder. Thank you. Um, so hopefully I've picked up on a couple of those questions. Thank you very much for uh, raising them. That's really good. Um, so we've got to working overseas. Right. So the next um, point I want to talk about, we're in the hot topics and uh, trends section at the moment, is um, what was dubbed the Great Resignation, uh, which was basically a result of people rethinking their life and work choices as a result of the pandemic and lots of people working from home or being furloughed and so on. Um, and I basically think as, as many people adapted to new ways of working, some began to reevaluate those kind of career decisions and workplace work, work life decisions. Um, there's also a, a reason for this you know, surge in resignations. And part of that is just backlog. Um, you know, a lot of people might have resigned during that, uh, the COVID years, but for job security and lack of vacancies, you know, decided not to. Um, so now there's more stability. Some of those resignations that would have taken place earlier, we've seen um, in the last, uh, you know, six months or more. Um, also, I think, there's, you know, increasingly the kind of burnout problem back to our, you know, focusing on employee well-being. I think that's reflected on people's decision making. Um, and also, you know, I think a lot of people have just thought more about what they want um, and the unexpected freedom that people had, you know, when they were working from home. Um, and so can they find a job that gives more flexibility or more hybrid or more agility um, in how and where they work. Um, and remember, we're also, you know, living longer and therefore working longer. So we're more likely to make more decisions um, during that, you know, period of time. Um, there's kind of three traditional phases that people normally have, kind of education phase, your work phase, and your retirement phase. And increasingly, I think those three phases are becoming a little bit more mixed. 
you know, people are, you know, increasing their education whilst they're working. People are, you know, retiring uh, uh, later or, or phasing in retirement with some, you know, part time working and so on. It's kind of a multi stage voyage, I think, for want of a description. Um, so I think that's, you know, the reason why we've seen a lot about the great resignation. Um, and also the kind of uh, the, uh, the other end of that spectrum or kind of related is this concept of the quiet quitting. Um, and for many, that kind of work hard, play hard culture pre pandemic, high productivity, monetization of every minute of your work. You know, that was really a benchmark for career success and, you know, how you get promoted and uh, progress through an organization and kind of you know, burnout and lack of well-being and, um, you know, work-life balance was just merely a byproduct, uh, a byproduct of, of what made you successful. So there's been a real pushback against that kind of approach, against that long hours culture um, and the kind of hustle to, to be, to get on time. Co that culture really has um, definitely come under the spotlight, I think. And I, I think this, the kind of quite quitting uh, label uh, was a sort of TikTok uh, social media um, uh, frenzy about workers actually posting uh, that they were doing the bare minimum to complete their tasks and, you know, leaving the office or shutting the computer, the, you know, the laptop lid dead on, um, you know, the end of their working day, not taking out of hours calls, not dealing with emails um, and other, you know, contact. Um, so it's also called, I think, ghost quitting. I saw it somewhere. Um, so you're not actually leaving your job, you're not quitting in any way, but you're, you know, taking, you're losing that I'm prepared to go above and beyond that kind of, um, you know, additional effort that some people were, were quite happy to put into their roles before. So people are still doing their job, they're just not going over and above um, in order to give any more. Um, and experts have kind of suggested that this quiet quitting trend is really connected and really part of you know, poor job satisfaction. Um, apparently only 9% of us are fully satisfied um, at work at the moment, are enthused about what we do, which is a pretty small number. And the last CIPD survey, I spoke to you about some of the survey results a bit earlier, also said that it's predicted about 20% of us plan to leave our jobs in this coming year. So whether you're seeing, you know, the, the great resignation, whether you're seeing quiet quitting, a lot of it is to do with job satisfaction and how people feel at work. The other thing's worth a mention, um, another kind of topic, hot topic, um, is that um, we saw much more in the news about the right to disconnect as a concept. And this initially came on my um spectrum, if you like, in 2016, when I read that France had kind of ushered in this right to disconnect legislation. And then I think Italy followed suit the following year, and then Spain and Portugal, and it was Ireland um, last year, and then Belgium this year, all brought in this right to disconnect. People putting in, you know, more working hours than ever during the pandemic. And then, you know, these um, these countries deciding that there needed to be some sort of legislation. Um, and I think it's something we should think about. We don't have it in the UK, but it's still something we can think about. If you're working outside of, uh, you, you know, normal working hours, you've got a delay delivery um, part to when you send an email. So why not? you know, delay the delivery of that email until someone else's normal working hours. I even saw someone write in there um, under their name when they signed an email. It had their you know name, their pronouns, job title, the rest of it. And then it said, uh, words to the effect of, I may well um, send emails outside of your normal working hours, but I don't ever expect you to read or respond to them. Um, you know, words to that effect. So I thought that was quite a nice touch as well. So especially with people working overseas, you know, my normal working hours might no longer be um, anyone else's. 
Um, so I think it's good to think about, you know, what burden we put on people outside of normal working hours. Um, and if they don't respond swiftly, should there be a price to pay for that? Um, you know, we want to avoid people having any stress and burnout in their roles. And if requiring them to, you know, eat into their personal time is part of that problem, then clearly we do need to, to be um, thoughtful about that. OK, moving on, um, just on the concept of, you know, combating these, you know, job satisfaction issues that, that are causing the quiet quitting and the great resignation and so on. You know, I think things that we can think about are I've listed on this slide. You know, how do we approach new starters and joiners? You know, offering mentorship is a great way to connect with people in a less hierarchical, formal way. Just reviewing your pay and benefits you know, are they as attractive as they can be to new people as well as um, to those already in your organisation? Um, you know, there's so much available now, flexi benefit wise, you know, perks, perk box. There's so many options that employers can look at to kind of engage and, um, you know, good, have as good additions to a package. You know, wellness offerings is really important. I see increasingly, you know, free gym memberships, yoga uh, meditation, you know, all these kind of good practices that people are trying, trying to bring into their employment um, kind of context. Communication and feedback, always good for job satisfaction, especially heightened where you've got home working and hybrid working. Um, you know, when, when people aren't on site very often, how do you make sure that you're connecting with them? You know, I've got one client who just books cups of tea, she calls them, into people's diaries. So it's literally 10 minute and it's not about work at all. Um, and I quite like that idea as well. And um, just making sure you're proactive in your connections um, and, you know, making time for people is part of that um, kind of the importance of that. Big announcements not always being done, you know, by paper or by email is really important as well. Having small group meetings as well as one to ones, giving people time to speak um, is part of that kind of that aspect of that. And I don't think you can, you know, limit uh, how how much you can gain from giving people great feedback, positive feedback, how long lasting that can be and how important it can be to someone um, I, I always subscribe to something called an emotional bank balance. So taking every opportunity to thank someone, to highlight something that's great, to, you know, give those you're doing a superb job. I loved the way you dealt with that. It all, if you think of it as money going into bank balance, each one of those is a deposit. That's another, you know, 20 quid. You build up a healthy balance. People, you know, that creates rapport. It builds trust. So when there is, you know, the more critical or the more negative issues that have to be dealt with, there's something to there's a balance to take from, um, you know, and people are much more open where they know they're going to get all the positive stuff as well. So I think it's, you know, can't be underestimated how important those kind of things are. Training and development, people expect that in their careers now, you know, it's really important for people to grow and to learn and to you know, make sure they have that kind of continuous improvement really unlocks people's skills for their future for your organization as well. And don't forget succession planning as well. People like to know where am I going? What's, you know, what's in it for me? And um, whole piece about recognition and reward systems. You know, I think it's a big impact to make sure that we've set up those kind of incentivized uh, you know, recognition programs as well, just shine a light on notable achievements publicly as well. Um, you know, even if your team just finishes, you know, half a day ahead of a deadline, that's something worth, you know, the whole organisation knowing about that. Um, the work-life balance, we've talked about that a fair bit already, you know, making sure that you're respectful, that you give people proper downtime, you know, without, it, without that being encroached upon, you know, and I think it's important for employees to set boundaries too. You know, if there's good reason that you can't work late or deal with something at a particular time, then let's be open about it. Let's make it easier all round um, by being open and clear. Um, flexible working, we've talked about as well. Um, and I think, again, it's another way to really 
peak job satisfaction if you can try and help somebody merge their work life with their home life to a way that causes them minimum stress is certainly is a real one for employee retention and then not forgetting the teamwork points you know it's it's important that people feel part of something it's really motivational to work with other people and to achieve something um, so we should encourage people to do that, not just the star players should get to put forward their ideas and solutions. You know, we should definitely make sure the whole team has those kind of opportunities um, and adapt to people's working styles and preferences as well. There's loads. I mean, we could talk for three hours alone about how to increase job satisfaction and job performance and so on. But hopefully a few of those points will be good reminders of things that, that you can do. And many of them with no cost at all. Um, OK, good. Going forwards. Um, the last point really on this on this uh, great resignation issue is that there is increasing talk about the great resignation turning into the great sacking. Um, if the predicted downturn comes and comes as badly as some are saying. I prefer the great reset to the great sacking. I think it's a much nicer sounding term. But, you know, are businesses already starting to look at where they can make reductions in their costs and or even their workforce to deal with um, any downturn in business? I, I listened to a podcast by which James Reed the CEO of Reed was talking about there won't be a recession. That's not likely at all. Um, so who knows? I think to be wary is probably the smartest um, option. I mean, earlier this year, we were reading about the massive shortage of skilled workers after the easing of you know, lockdown restrictions, sizable pay increases, you know, paying far more to recruit people. So, you know, it could be a sh a, in the space of a relatively short period of time, we go from you know, that kind of issue to maybe um, a downsizing for some organisations. Um, anyway, something to think about. Always being prepared, being ahead of the game is really important. You know, rising inflation, pay rises, you know, being really under the hot focus light at the moment. Some sectors seeing, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, people going on strike because they're just not, their pay is not keeping track with, you know, the cost of living changes all things um, that we need to think about. OK, um, next on our list was employee well-being. And I think it's fair to say that increasingly the employer is becoming more and more responsible for, for well-being at work. Health and wellness are absolutely hot topic buttons without you know, any doubt at all. Um, I think there's a few things to think about here. Um, how we support people's health and well-being is the first one. Um, and I see that not only in just how we manage their work and workload, but also increasing people's skills in resilience and stress management and, you know, being able to say no, even assertiveness is really important. Um, mental first aiders, mental health days, expanded EAP offerings, employee assistance programs, counselling, financial incentives, you know, all the health stuff I mentioned with gym memberships and and the such like health insurance. And um, there's loads of things, even, even subsidized healthy meals, um, fruit and, you know, healthy snacks. There's lots of things that we can do to enhance, <coughs> excuse me, employee well-being. But what I think is far more important than all of the things that we might bring into an organization is just have, having that culture where people are reasonably managed and encouraged to be open about how they're feeling and how they're doing and what their workload is like and all those kind of things. A culture that says it's safe to say is probably the most important thing you can do. You know, we need to stop stress-related ill health before it starts, not manage it when it's um, in place. Um, so having those conversations, you know, I find lots of my managers will say, oh, I have lots of one to ones. I'm really good at that. I do it weekly. I do it fortnightly. I do it monthly, whatever they do. And then when you dig into the kind of detail about, well, what are you talking about? So often it's just about tasks, work, deadlines, business. And it's not about how you are, what you need. How do you feel? 
what can I do to support you? Um, you know, I think sometimes we need to get away from the work type conversation and just talk about the individuals. I love walking meetings as well. It's a great opportunity, obviously, if you can, to connect you know, physically with someone, get out of the work environment, which instantly frees people up, makes people more comfortable to speak. Harder to take notes, obviously, when you're walking, but, you know, you don't always need to do that. I think just changing things up sometimes is really good. And also making sure that your managers are leading by example. It's all very well saying to people, you must take your breaks. You know, you must have a proper work life balance. You must say if things are, you know, are overwhelming or difficult. And then all the managers are working ridiculously long hours, look stressed, you know, to the hilt, you know, and aren't living that kind of role model. Um, and part of my job is to deal with conduct um, investigations, grievances, harassment, bullying. I do them all the time. Burnout. I've even had to deal with some you know, workplace um, suicide cases. And it's, you know, really heart rendering when you can see, you can see the build up to something. Hindsight's a great thing, but, you know, try and look at things holistically and make sure that, you know, we're ahead of the curve, ahead of the game um, and keep people, you know, happy and healthy and productive at work. Okay, and then I think this is the last of those hot topics. Um, which is the cost of living crisis. I mean, this is never out of the news at the moment. Um, and it's really also to some extent related to that, um, you know, employee well-being point as well. Um, but against the kind of backdrop of soaring prices, food, energy, you know, electricity, fuel for cars, essential goods, everything, um, We've got to think about employee, the impact of that on our employees. And I know increasingly employers are looking to ways that they can support uh, employees uh, for these kind of um, issues and how they affect people. But in saying that, one in five workers in a recent survey found that their employer was not doing enough to support their financial well-being. And that rise is far higher in for when it comes to low paid workers. Um, so what can you do? Well, I think the main thing is to review your reward strategy. Can you afford a real cost of living increase? And if so, can you pay that? If not, is there a kind of a winter bonus that you can give or is there any financial reward that can be uh, given to support people with very real difficulties? Obviously, that's not always possible. But, you know, I think also speaking to people about uh, about this, making sure that you're aware of what impacts people at work is often important. Also, the point you make these payments might be interesting for those who claim universal credit or tax credit. So again, you know, if you're making payments, it might be worth having a conversation about whether they positively impact or could be given at a better time for some people as well. Um, reviewing your financial well-being policies is really important. You know, what do we do? Does our EAP service? I mean, one, do we have an EAP provider, employee assistance provider? If we do, does it include, you know, budgeting support, help with, um, you know, debts and loans? Can we offer interest free crisis loans? I've seen employers do that for things like car breakdowns or boiler repairs. Um, can we offer travel loans for season tickets? Um, even in the press very recently is an increase in the concept of on-demand pay. Um, for those of you that haven't heard of it, it's often referred to as earned wage access, EWA. And this is um, where the payroll service allows employees to access some of their wages earned earlier in the month before pay date. So, you know, I've worked for two weeks, I can access one week, for example. Obviously, there's risks from doing that as well. But, you know, it's something that some employers are doing. Um, look also at your benefits package as well as your remuneration. Is it working hard enough for those um, most in need? Is there anything else you can do? You know, I've seen employers allow people to sell back their annual leave. You can't go below the statutory minimum, but some employers go above. Um, can you allow people to sell that back 
So, um, you know, they get some extra pay, for example, healthcare that pays dental and opticians appointments, you know, encouraging people to make use of those if they're not aware of what you already offer. And then I think finally, just training managers, being empathetic, being approachable, having that kind of management style where you can normalize difficult conversations about money and, uh, you know, let people sometimes they just need to speak. Um, don't fall into the trap of becoming a counsellor when you're not, you know, refer people for help uh, rather than try and, you know, make it up yourself. Good way, I think, to approach it, and this would be my kind of top tip here, is to look at what you offer people through the lens of your lowest paid employees. Um, you know, understanding what it's like for those on the tightest budget um, is probably an important way to, to start if you want to make some change or look at how you can review something. OK, good. Um, so poll question number four. Um, so this is who is liable for an employee's misbehaviour towards another employee, i.e. if there's sexual harassment at the Christmas function? So who has the liability? Is it the employer or the employee? OK, so again, it's a simple choice. 30 seconds should be enough for you. Oh, very certain this time. So we've got 93% saying the employer and 7% saying the employee. So I think that's a very definite uh, response there. And kind of, I was a bit sneaky with not giving you a third option, which said it depends on the circumstances, because I think maybe a lot of you would have picked that one. But it does depend on the circumstances, but I'm with the majority here. Primarily liability lies with the employer, as they are something that's called vicariously liable for the actions um, and acts of um, and comments of its em employees, of their employees. And Christmas parties, are, you know, is a classic point, sadly, where difficulties sometimes arrive. It doesn't just have to be a Christmas party, it could be any party. Um, but um, if something takes place and the principle applies where the conduct happens in the course of employment, where there is a sufficiently close connection to work, then that's where the employer's liability might arise. So if there is an act of sexual harassment, you know, the alleged, per alleged perpetrator is likely to be suspended. Remember, that's on full pay. The disciplinary process will apply. It starts with an investigation and the investigating um, employee, manager, officer, or if you outsource it, um, consultant will be trying to establish facts. So that involves taking witness statements, um, you know, maybe looking at CCTV if it's available. Um, and then depending on the outcome of that, there may be a disciplinary hearing. And if it's sufficiently serious, then dismissal might result. But also the alleged victim uh, may also bring a sexual harassment case in my example and want to go via ACAS to the employment tribunal. Now, loyal, um, liability can shift to the employee if the employer can show that they have taken all reasonable steps to prevent that harassment. And there's no prescriptive list of what steps have to be taken for an employer to discharge that, um, that obligation. But the general things that one would expect to see is that there's a you know, good, robust uh, policy about equality and anti-harassment, that it's regularly reviewed and updated, that it's been distributed and is known, and then it's followed in the event of an issue, you know, thorough investigation, things dealt with appropriately. Um, and then, then also an employer has to have regular, tailored and effective staff training for staff members as well as for managers that's regularly refreshed and delivered. 
And I, as I said earlier, do lots of this training. And for some organizations, I do it every second year, all employees attend. So, you know, if an employer takes all those reasonable steps, um, then they may be able to escape liability. And then it's for the employee to defend their uh, whatever their actions are. And potentially if they lose, it becomes for the employee to pay as well. And, you know, Christmas dues, I've I've sat on many at the Employment Tribunal. I've dealt with loads as, you know, investigating and deal with dealing with those kind of matters. It never surprises me what people will do when normally they've had too much alcohol to drink. Um, but, you know, what does an employer to do about that? Well, the answer is, you know, quite a lot. And increasingly, and this has been around for a few years, um, you know, we had the kind of period where there were very few uh, Christmas dues and Christmas functions in our COVID years, but they're definitely back. And I know it seems early to talk about it, but, you know, it's not that far away um, already thinking about Christmas. Um, obviously, you you know, you could ban all your difficult people from going to a Christmas function, but that's not really a uh, likely to be something that you can do and you'd be a bit of a killjoy for that as well but there are other ways that you can minimize difficulty you know first of all I think you should not make attendance at Christmas functions compulsory it should be <clears throat> a voluntary event you don't want to inadvertently discriminate against people who can't make it because of a clash of timing. You know, maybe it's to do with childcare. Maybe it clashes with other non-religious um, dates. You know, I think let's think about whether a lunchtime event might be better than an evening event, for example. So think about when you have your event and also that it's not compulsory. You know, we need to treat all employees equally. So don't forget your fixed term workers, your part time staff. You know, I would include your agency staff as well, if appropriate. Um, ensuring that you don't forget to invite people on maternity, paternity, adoption, you know, other family friendly leave or even those that are off sick long term. It might be that they can't attend work and do their job, but could they attend a you know social function and eat a lunch for example um, be mindful about under 18s attending you know some bars don't permit under 18s so there may be age issues there obviously be considerate with any disabled employee access to venues i mean all venues should be accessible but definitely worth checking and considering that and then the big one is reminding employees how to behave and, and what appropriate, <clears throat> excuse me, behaviour looks like. Um, so again, I've seen invites that have that set out. I've seen policies that have that set out, um, reinforcing, you know, good behaviours or behavioural expectations, forewarning people um, that it would be considered in the course of employment if there were issues is important. And don't forget to think about secret Santa presence. I've sat on a few cases over the years of really inappropriate gifts being given. Um, so a few things to think about um, with your Christmas functions. Um, there's lots of case law about Christmas dues. It even includes injuries caused at Christmas dues. There were a few um, last year that I'll pick up when I do a case law review um, at the beginning of next year. Um, but it is something to think about. There are lots of issues that arise and these are very newsworthy issues often um, as well. So, yeah, give it some thought if you're planning on having a function this year. Um, good. OK, I've just um, remembered that there were a couple of questions that came in uh, by email, not on the chat. So I just want to uh, mention those as well as we've got a few minutes left. So one of them was, can a company state in the contract for part-time workers that holiday is only accrued on their contracted hours and does not include any additional or overtime hours worked? If all hours have to be included, when did this change? Well, there was a decision in the Employment Appeals Tribunal um, a few years ago now. So the answer to that question, can a company state in the contract for part-time workers that their holiday only accrues on contracted hours is probably no. I think the answer is no, you can't do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Just the same as you could not do that for full-time people either. And remember, we have to treat part-time and full-time 
people in a comparable way. So this all changed. The other part of the question was, if not, when did this change? And this changed in 2014 and 15. Um, again, have a look at the ACAS website because it sets out, um, you know, what, how you calculate um, holiday pay, what average working weeks should be and so on. And there's lots of case law now that says overtime that people regularly work should be included in that um, calculation. So um, I think whoever sent that question in, the answer is no, you really probably can't do that um, and check what should be included on the Gov website, but definitely consistently worked over time will go into the calculations. And then the other question was um, someone who wrote in and said, working in a supermarket on the checkouts, doing a six hour busy shift um, if someone is not allowed a break after requesting it, um, is that unlawful, basically? So this is interesting because it says that the person working on the checkout is booked um, or the shift uh, duration is six hours. And I think I mentioned it earlier when we were talking about employee rights, is that if you work six hours or less, you have no right to any uh, break during that six hour shift. So six hour shift, no break, six hours and 15 minutes shift, then the statutory minimum comes in, which is a 20 minute break. And that 20 minutes can't be taken at the start or the end of the shift. It has to be taken part way through, and it could be split into two kind of 10 minute breaks, for example, and, and people can choose to take that away from their place of work as well. The second half of this question, though, related to um, time off for toilet breaks. Um, and is there any right to have a toilet break? And um, you may be surprised to learn that there's no legislation um, and no employment law about the number or duration of toilet breaks that someone should have. There's just simply no mention of this at all. Um, but again, if it's under a six hour shift, I think it's pretty unreasonable to say you can't have any break to go to the toilet at all. And I definitely think if that were the case, that would give rise to some constructive unfair dismissal complaints. It would definitely give rise to some grievances. And um, remember, in particular, you know, there are some people that may need more toilet breaks than others as well. Pregnant women, you know, during the menopause, certain health issues and disabilities, even taking certain, certain medication can increase. Um, so it's pretty unreasonable to say no. So even though there's no right to any break, it would be, in my view, pretty unreasonable and give rise to, to complaint should that restriction be given to somebody. Um, good, but of course, raise a grievance first. Um, you get a deduction of up to 25% in any compensatory award if you haven't raised a grievance. So it's definitely, and it was, should solve the problem in any event, um, whoever wrote that question in. So I think we've pretty much come to the end now. So unless there's any final questions, let me just check the chat. No, and nothing new in the Q&A either. So, um, that's it. Thank you very much indeed. I hope it's been a good refresher uh, or a reminder of a few things. Um, and thank you for all your questions as well as we've gone along and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and your weekend. Thank you.